Hello everyone, welcome back to another exciting video. In this video, we will discuss about some of the loss functions we use in the regression problems. Now let's get a bit of context here. Regression involves predicting a specific value that is continuous in nature. Some of the examples are predicting the house prices, weather forecasting, etc. Let us consider the car price prediction problem. This is how the data looks like. The inputs are age of the car, kilometers driven so far and the type of the fuel. And we have to predict the selling price of the car which is our target. Now if we want to solve this using neural networks, we will pass this to the network like this and we get the predicted values for each case like this. Now we should get a way to know whether these are correct or not. This is where the loss functions are used. Loss functions are used to calculate the difference between the predicted values and the target values. And based on this loss, we will adjust the parameters of the network. By adjusting the parameters, we will try to reduce the loss as much as possible and get the accurate predictions. This is what happens during the training. Now let's see how to calculate this loss value. So I got the actual values like this and these are my predicted values. I took five examples here. Now we need to compare these two vectors and calculate the loss value. How do we do this? One simple way is to take the difference between both. This gives us these values and then we take the sum of these values to get a single value. Now this value is the accumulation of errors of all the five examples. But we need to have an average value because this summation depends on the number of examples. We have five examples here and we got 0.9. If we have 50 examples, we might get bigger number. So irrespective of the number of examples, we should take a single value which is our average value. So that's why we take the average value by dividing this with 5 which will give me 0.18. This is my final loss value. Let's put this whole process in a formula. This is what we have done. Y predicted minus target values and all these errors we are summing up for all the examples and dividing with the number of examples which will give me mean value. And this is called mean bias error. Now why do we call this a bias error? For that, let's understand what is a bias. This is not the bias from neural networks. This is the bias from statistics. Now, did you recognize this plot? We might have seen this plot many times, right? This plot shows the difference between bias and variance. So this center red dot is our target. Let's assume that. And all these violet dots are our network predictions. Now bias gives me the overall direction of the error. So let's see what do you mean by that. So here I am saying I have high bias in both these cases. If you observe, all my predictions are in one particular direction towards the top side. Even in this case, all my predictions are towards the top side. So that's what bias gives. It gives the overall direction of the error. It is actually a simple average of all the errors. And variance actually measures the spread of our predictions. So if you see, I don't have any variance here because all my predictions are near to each other. That means mostly they are in a specific range, very near to each other. Whereas here in these two cases, the predictions are far from each other. They spread across a bigger region. So that is what variance gives me. If the variance is less, you can see that the precision is high here. Whereas if the variance is high, then the precision is low. Now let us understand the bias for our car price example. Let us suppose all my output predictions are around the range of 50 lakhs. But our actual targets in our example data set doesn't have the values anywhere near that. So there is a bias in the predictions towards the higher side. And similarly, if all the prices are less than 1 lakh, then there is a bias towards the lower side. So all the predictions are grouped towards one particular side of the error. So what we are calling it a bias here, it is actually average of all the errors, right? So it is a mean error. And this is actually a mean error. So that's why we call this formula as mean bias error or you can say bias. Now can you tell me the drawback of this error? Let's consider this example. What is our bias error here? So it can be calculated by taking the differences, right? And I have six values here, so I divided with six. And finally, I'm getting zero. Why is that? Because I'm getting plus 0.5 here and minus 0.5 here. These two will get canceled out. And the same way, minus 0.5 here and plus 0.5 here. These two will get canceled out. And the same way, these two will get canceled out. So even though there is an error existing between these two values, because of this positive and negative cancellations, my total value is becoming zero. So the error is zero. So but are my predictions matching the actual targets? No, right? So that is a flaw actually. Because of this negative and positive values cancellation, we might not get the correct estimate of the error. So that's why this MBE is uh, rarely used. Now let's try to solve this issue using the absolute values. That's why we call this as mean absolute error. It's nothing but taking the mean of absolute values. Whatever we have done previously, instead of taking the normal differences, you take the absolute difference. And it looks like this. 
So it's just an absolute difference. Everything else the same. Let us consider our example and calculate the error here. So this is my example. And if I calculate the error, so as these are absolute values, everything is positive sign. There is no negative here. And finally, I'm getting 1.58 as my error value. This is simple to calculate and it is computationally inexpensive. So this is a better loss function compared to mean bias error. Now there is another name for it. We call this as L1 loss. So these two terms absolute error and L1 loss are actually interchangeably used. Now what if I want the error as a percentage? Then we can use mean absolute percentage error. So how do I get the percentage? I have to divide with some value, right? So here we divide with the targets. That is what it is happening here. So whatever the absolute difference I got, I am dividing with the target value for that instance. Now what is the advantage of doing this? Why do I need to divide with target? Why do I need to normalize it? Let us understand with an example. This is my data set and these are my predictions. If you observe most of my predictions and the actual data set are in a different range, whereas only one example, it is in hundreds. So the scale is changing here. Maybe you can consider this as an outlier or something, but it is different from the others. Now, if I calculate the mean absolute error, I will get 60 because the difference is 300. And if I divide with the five, so I'm getting almost uh, 60, right? Because of single value, I'm getting the high absolute error. But if I take percentage error, then I will get 0.29. Why is it? Because whatever the difference I'm getting 300 between these two, I am dividing with again 725 here. So which will always give me the value between zero and one. This is actually independent of scale and it is also robust to outliers like this. That's all from this video. We will see some more loss functions in the next video. Thank you for watching.